I'm Abby Kinney, and you are listening to UpZoned. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of UpZoned, a show where we take a big story from the news each week that touches the Strong Towns conversation, and we UpZone it. We talk about it in depth. I'm Abby Kinney, an urban planner in Kansas City, and joining me today is Norm Van Eden Petersman, who is a member of the Strong Towns team working as the member advocate. So, Norm... Welcome back to UpZoned. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much, Abby. It's great to be back. Um, You'll have to excuse me because I have a little bit of a sinus infection. Hopefully it's not noticeable. This is my annual sinus infection that I get when it's becoming the springtime here. (laughs) So it's um, an indication that that winter has officially ended in Kansas City. I don't know how it is up in Canada for you, but... Um, I'm from the Midwest, so I have to bring up the seasons changing. It's really, it's part of the deal here. Yeah. Well, I had a chance to be in uh, Salt Lake City in in the Utah area uh, just this week. And it was nice to see snow because we got so little of it this year in in Vancouver, where I'm from. So, um, but you said that you're dealing with a sinus cold, but I'm dealing with the the low level anxiety that I have as a renter whenever I talk about (laughs) rental situations and whenever we talk about these types of topics. Um, so that's what I'm dealing with, uh, but it'll make for a great discussion. I hope. Yes. So we have a kind of an interesting article today. We talk about housing a lot, and this is an angle that I think is not really well explored. Um, it was published in the Wall Street Journal by Will Parker. The article is entitled Three Million U.S. Households Making Over $150,000 Are Still Renters. So according to five-year estimates from the U.S. Census Bureau, the number of households that are renting while also making $150,000 or more uh, per year has nearly doubled between 2016 and 2021. This is a national statistics, but cities like Austin, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, and Phoenix, Arizona saw even greater surges in this statistic. Um, of what they're calling high-income rental households. Particularly particularly since 2020, there are a number of significant factors that are probably contributing to this anomaly. Um, Housing sale prices and construction costs are greatly costs are greatly inflated. We have some national migration patterns between the big coastal cities and these new popular mid-sized cities. Uh, There's an increase in interest rates that are coming into play here. So this is all really making the rental market more competitive than it was before. Um, And I think that, you know, talking about this offline with you and Daniel, what I think stood out to all of us was this questioning of home ownership as a status symbol, which it always has been kind of this, idea that that it's tied to your status in society or whether or not you've quote unquote made it. Um, Daniel kind of jokingly questioned about this idea of high income renters being posed as temporarily embarrassed homeowners. Um, and he says that <laughs> uh, tongue in cheek, of course. Uh, so I think that that's something that's worth kind of talking about because it does seem like this article is posing the issue that way that it is, you know, really weird and odd that people would be making high incomes, but not um, owning a home. And in some cases, not striving to own a home. Yeah. And it's so interesting because there's the two components of it. One is the owning of a parcel of property and the other is having a place to live. And I think that's where the disconnect as we've allowed our, our systems to basically artificially capture wealth or artificially inflate uh, the amount of wealth that you can have by owning a small parcel of land or even a parcel of air rights in up up in a third story of a tower or something like that that the consequence of that is that you actually realize if you're not investing in that uh, property you're going to be missing out on one of the hottest investments that you can have now I sound like a realtor when I say that but I mean historically especially in our area uh, where I'm from in the Vancouver market, to have a house is to basically be sitting on mm-hmm. a gold mine. And that creates a lot of artificial 
uh, interventions that people are willing to buy properties, uh, 18,000 condo units that were built in Vancouver uh, between 2018 and 2020, uh, that when they introduced a vacancy tax, which actually imposed a 3% holding fee, uh, all of a sudden those 18,000 units suddenly were on the rental market. That is quite staggering that people are willing to even forego fairly high rents because it's not worth it for them to go through the process of securing a tenant and doing all of those sorts of things when they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on their primary investment that they've made in a parcel or in a property. Now, when we step back, we say, well, on one level, you know, it is interesting to see what do the rich do and does that set a new pattern for us? Uh, but the challenges that it exposes of, of securing a rental market over the long haul, I think are a huge a challenge that we're going to be dealing with for quite a while when there just is so little supply available in many of our, our hotter markets. But even in our smaller communities, we have rental uh, sh shortages. And when people are not able to bring to the bank the money that they need or to be able to prove that they have the income level necessary, sometimes six, eight, ten times their annual salary being required in order to, or not being required, but being uh, basically the amount of cost that it would cost to purchase a home. Uh, it means it drives that many more people into an already under under serviced uh, rental uh, uh, market. Yeah, and it makes the rental market, of course, more competitive. Meaning that really, this isn't a story necessarily about people making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and more. To me, this is more of a story about what happens to people who are considered middle class, whatever that actually means or how you define that, as well as people who, I mean, could barely afford what they're paying now and certainly can't afford if their cost of living increases really at all. Um, because if all of a sudden you have a new surge of people who are moving into your market, then make it in their planning to rent that is going to have an incredible effect on your current rental market. Um, it, and it makes me think of this idea of, you know, we talk about in cities, gentrification, displacement patterns at kind of a regional scale. But when we zoom out and think of this, you know, as really the entire continent or even on a global scale, we have to be thinking about how money is moving and what the patterns are and how that actually impacts people, especially since COVID. We have a lot of people who are have been living maybe in California or New York, and maybe they were high income earners, high income homeowners, and were able to sell their house and move to a place like Austin or Nashville uh, into these kind of, I would say they're that... Um, these mid-sized cities are kind of the new front row cities and they were able to take advantage of this market and people who maybe are able to um, work from home and live anywhere are looking at cities and seeing the benefits um, of these mid-sized cities and seeing the benefits. And so it just makes me think about this idea of like a national displacement pattern that could be happening here because of the high income earners that are moving to these places. And it happens that in two ways. One is just a rental to rental sort of exchange where a landlord says, oh, I can charge more because there's somebody that's just showed up. They've got a tech job. And if I just promise them high speed internet, I will be able to get the, the new rent that I set, which previously would have seemed crazy, but I can ask for it and I'll get it because there's very little available. Another component of it is also, and we see this in our city, the purchasing of formerly rental properties yeah. and the transforming of those places into large single detached homes. And that that is another problem that you're you're losing it on both ends when you have an influx, but you also have this this bleeding out of previously somewhat affordable rentals and they're being converted back into private ownership. I, I bought a bicycle off of somebody in Vancouver and and the the mother-in-law was living in a garden suite or a, in a granny suite on the on the basement level. But she said, yeah, this house used to be, I think it was uh, had four different units in it. And my daughter, she's a fashion designer. And so she's done well for herself. Uh, they basically had uh, to go to City Hall in order to convince them to downzone it. So that way it could just be a single family home. And the class warrior in me was like, what? How dare they? And yet that's just a normal thing that someone will do with an investment. They are going to make it fit to their purposes. The trouble is that the net supply 
of rentals uh, drops even further. And when, I mean, in Vancouver, we have, I think it's a 0.1% vacancy rate uh, on the vast majority of our, of our available rentals. And so in that situation, you the, the effect is, is not going to be felt by those that are wealthy. Uh, they are making most likely a financial and lifestyle decision. They're deciding, you know, I'm going to park my money in a high yield investment, or I'm going to invest in something speculative. And meanwhile, I just need to pay a nominal fee of $3,500 to rent this luxury penthouse. Meanwhile, and, and at the same time, uh, taking into account that they might move on. And so it's quite nice to have, you know, no strings attached. They can simply move to the next city that they want to go to. The difficulty is that that sets in motion uh, an uplifting of the whole market, uh, resulting in, again, these types of conversions where someone, you know, sim similar to the pattern of, of Airbnb, that people are saying like, oh, I could get more if I rent it on Airbnb yeah. or if I rent it, make it nicer and, and rent it to a wealthy person, uh, someone that's earning considerable amounts of money. I guess the challenge is uh, how much do we hope for a crash to occur and will our governmental structures and financial systems actually be willing to allow that to happen. Silicon Valley Bank uh, just collapsed, and yet already there's immediately steps being taken to backstop it, to basically remove all of the prior risk that even was understood to exist yeah. in it, and yet being uh, taken back. And so when I think of uh, the financial advice that I've read uh, out there, which is like, you know, don't buy a house, rent, and with the additional money that you have, uh, use that to do great investments. And I always felt like I was doing the first part, which was renting. And I've never been able to figure out how to put aside so much extra money that I could do, go off and do like wildly speculative and, and remarkably lucrative things with it. Like <laughs> that's the problem of being rent burdened is there's just nothing left and you haven't built up an yeah. asset uh, at the same time. Yeah, definitely. And so... I also think we're kind of talking about these two aspects of housing where ha existing housing is being inflated for all of these reasons that we've talked about. And that's both housing that is owned and housing that is rent or rented. And new construction is also very unaffordable to build. So this all makes me think, what what do you do about the people who can't afford for existing housing to be inflated to this level and can't afford what can be constructed um, as a new building because this, you know, we're going to see a lot of changes in the market and we are going to see changes in buying and renting patterns from these high income earners. But if construction housing costs, housing construction costs are at all time highs, then developers don't really have a choice but to market them as luxury to this kind of market and housing for middle and lower income people is it, it's literally not possible to build unless you have tremendous amounts of subsidy or it's a very special circumstance that really can't be scaled. So this entire multifamily market sector seems to have shifted completely from people who from being for people who maybe, you know, weren't able to afford to buy a home in the past to really a competitive option that high income earners are actually preferring rather than it being like a, you know, considered a, a secondary life situation or what, whatever you mentioned in, in Canada, some, some official um, had, had uh, called it something that was not very nice that they had to backtrack on. Yeah, that's right. Andrew Wilkinson uh, will probably have lived to regret uh, saying this, but he was the leader of the, the more conservative party called the Liberal Party in BC. But uh, he said, oh, wha uh, renting, that's a wacky yeah. time of life. Uh, it was fun. It was enjoyable. It's just a rite of passage. And and the response was, I mean, his concern was to um, actually be advancing a, a description of, of a policy that they were trying to uh, bring in in order to encourage more home, home ownership and allow people an easier path and, and remove some of the, the pressures that were in the market. But people jumped on it and they said, you know, is there something wrong with renting or is there something wrong that like you just haven't grown up yet? And is somebody earning more than $150,000? Are they irresponsible and immature if they haven't actually just committed and you know bought a place already? And the reality is that most people can't afford to buy a home at yeah. this point. Uh, they're faced with you know serious challenges if you desire to remain in in a single in a single place. Um, 
I love the place that I live. I care about the people that I'm around and I want to stay here. And yet the rational part of my brain says like, what are you doing? Like move to Utah or move to Wyoming or move to, well, I wouldn't go to the States uh, without a proper passport, but move to, you know, Saskatchewan in the middle of these places. But there's a, there's a balance there where we, we aspire to live in communities that uh, will bring us opportunity. Mm. And we often perceive that more um, metropolitan areas will offer that access to better schools or better universities, better jobs, better better cultural resources, whatever that is. But it comes at a great cost and a great strain. And, and there are those, actually the home that we now rent uh, is a home that was sold uh, by a couple and they moved to New Brunswick. Um, they moved clear across the country in order to uh, buy a larger mm. property and, and settle into a place there. And they had enjoyed, I think about a $400,000 increase in their investment. They bought it for 450, $450,000 for the house and sold it for an 899,000. Wow. Like I wish I had done that. <laughs> yeah. And so one of the interesting things to touch on that I shared in the notes ahead of time was a friend of mine, uh, we were commiserating because we both in, went into nonprofit work. I served as a pastor. Uh, he was serving in, in social services and both of us had gotten master's degrees. And it was always, you know, in high school, it's like, oh, take, you know, if you go to college, you can expect to earn this much. If you go to university, you can expect to earn this much. And if you go and get a master's or do a PhD or something, um, you can expect either to be completely broke or to be earning a certain amount. And the reality that we said is the best thing we should have done is just get out of high school, get a great, you know, a steady job and immediately begin working to get that down payment together and buy a house. And had we done that, I, I was in the lower mainland of, Bank, of uh, British Columbia uh, in 2003 through 2007. By 2014, house prices had skyrocketed uh, from where they previously had been. Had I had I just bought that house even before I went to university, I would have been, I would be yeah. sad. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of homeowners struggle to understand when people are renting is why are you still renting? And in many instances, it's it's not actually a lifestyle decision. It's actually just a lack of financial capacity to do it if you're paying down loans and things like that. But it does seem that if you have gone and taken on further education, you've actually set yourself back on an opportunity to really ride a great roller coaster on its way up. And what I've kept hoping for is a crash, which in full disclosure is not fair to the rest of you, <laughs> but it, this thing ain't going to crash. I think Chuck has been very persuasive. The the re real estate market is so vital to the way that we've structured our, our house mm -hmm. of cards uh, that it will be one of the last things to crash. Uh, there will not be this you know bargain basement uh, sale opportunity uh, anytime soon, and and that's really discouraging. Uh, that's that was what happened in the 1980s. It was all of a sudden, and I understand that there's an emotional and personal and financial cost to being underwater with your mortgage and being faced with, you know, just the reality. You cannot afford to live in a house that now costs you more uh, than it is worth. But the flip side of it is that we actually need those corrections. And without those corrections, um, you know, the correction, I think that these these folks that are renting at $150,000 annual incomes, they're waiting for the correction and they're saying, I'm waiting for a better buy. And they would be in a well placed to actually make a great purchase if prices go down considerably. But many other people are going to be financially ruined. And so that's the challenge. I think that's the stress. Uh, the other piece is I'm hoping to start a housing co-op to just like step right out of that whole thing. Uh, our slogan is no profits, just homes. And eventually uh, this thing will get built. Uh, we, we won't have landlords and we won't have profits, but we will at least have a place to call our own. And I, I would welcome anybody that's making $150,000 uh, to come live with us. Um, but uh, at the same time, we need a lot of people just to step up and, and be part of that. Um, stepping out of the financialized housing industry seems like madness unless you're either really committed uh, philosophically or have no other options, which is definitely where we are. So uh, if I had my druthers, I'd buy a house, but I can't. So I'm going to start a co-op and hopefully uh, get a good crew around me. Well, it definitely occurs to me that this entire situation is creating, you know, kind of a haves and haves not class, yeah. class structure. And, and really a lot of, a lot of the people who might be considered on the haves end of that equation are really just there out of luck. Like you mentioned, you could have not gone to university bought in a house and maybe have a lot more wealth than you do today. And it's really just being in the right place at the right time. And a lot of it is about luck. I And I think a lot of homeowners may not think of it that way, but 
it's it's kind of the reality, right? Because it's uh, there are people who I think maybe want to buy a home, but they just are, have not been able to uh, overcome this this high high and and rising barrier to entry in order to enter into that investment. I mean, if you need to have a hundred thousand dollars to join the club or more cash up front, that's a very challenging investment to to actually enter into. And people may be looking for other options, although I don't know if there are investments that are as easy to understand and as beneficial as housing has been in the past. Yeah. And I do think that one of the elements is to open up new opportunities for more lower income rentals. Uh, rentals, and this is the challenge that I think a lot of our cities are grappling with top down solutions like inclusionary zoning policies. And I am, I think, somewhat resigned to the fact that we probably have that coming in our future in our city so that any new project will be obliged to provide either a contribution towards an affordable housing fund or will actually provide those units yeah. within it. But it is interesting to see the, the ways in which property developers, to their own credit, are trying to preserve their own interest and profit margins. And so as a result, even fudging the the a uh, description of like what constitutes an affordable rental uh what constitute you know is it an affordable rental or an attainable rental and and all of the different language games that we play and, and the strong towns approach that as as we continue to sort of outline this for for folks across the countries is saying you know what do we need we need to return to that bottom up responses uh, to pressing needs. And so if there's a housing shortage, you should see lots of small, you know, new housing types emerging, uh, backyard dwellings, uh, accessory dwelling units or cottage, uh, little cottages, uh, that sort of stuff. If you have, you know, people are willing to live in tiny homes for lifestyle reasons or for financial reasons, most of our cities still don't permit those things to take place. And so states like Utah, where I, I just was uh, doing an event, they have legalized or they have basically allowed um, made it possible that anyone can have an accessory dwelling unit, a detached or a, an interior uh, dwelling unit uh, on their property. But municipalities can step in and say what uh, width of a lot needs to apply, how much of the square footage uh, needs to be taken up by the primary dwelling versus the accessory mm. dwelling. And they basically tell it through a thousand yeah. cuts. And so it is making some progress, uh, but you take what Minneapolis did. Minneapolis's reforms of their single family zoning to allow multiple units or Thunder Bay, Ontario just did this as well, allowing up to four units per, per property uh, based on a couple of parameters around lot sizes and things like that. That will actually put way more of the rentals that we really need, not the full house rentals for the 150,000 plus earners, but actually the smaller units, the granny flats or the, the neighborhood or the in-law suites, whatever you want to call them. Uh, those are the things that we need to begin to almost filter in uh, to our, our existing neighborhoods because... I mean, we should be clear that like housing belongs on housing land. Yeah. And so if there's ways to incrementally increase that housing, uh, a key barrier is parking requirements. Uh, that was one of the things that was holding back a lot of secondary suites uh, in our city. So we still don't allow detached accessory dwellings. You can have a house for your pool and you can have a house for your golf cart, but you can't have a house for your mother wow. <laughs> um, if you're separated from the house. And yet at the same time, uh, what we need to have happen is just to make sure that uh, within existing neighborhoods, if we've already set this land aside for housing and for some retail, let's make sure that it is one mixed use, allowing more uses, but also that uh, we're intensifying those those neighborhoods uh, where we've already committed the resources to provide road sewers, fire coverage, and all of that sort of stuff along there. Yeah, absolutely. Because if this is if the way to address housing development and expanding the market to hopefully address these issues and um, accommodate both high income and low income housing on the outskirts of town, that is going to be a really bad outcome. Um, we need to be focusing yeah. on what we've already built, the neighborhoods that exist and making even existing housing as flexible as possible, which is unfortunately a hard ask in some places, but we are seeing a lot of, a lot of good changes happening and a lot of places that are starting to make make zoning changes and and respond to these needs. And I, I kind of wonder if 20 years from now, 
we'll see the outcomes of that in, in certain cities versus the cities that did not make any changes um, to their to their zoning and to what they can accommodate based on what people need. So, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well, this is a really interesting discussion. I, I'm I'm looking forward to even reading more articles about these shifts that we're seeing that are kind of the post COVID world and how this really shakes out. Um, I'm, I'm a homeowner and I could not rebuy my house. I can't buy, I can't afford to buy any house in my area. (laughs) So I definitely, you know, I, I was a renter just a couple of years ago and I can feel your pain. There's, I, if I would have waited, I wouldn't be owning a home and, it's a situation where it's just I was in the right place at the right time, and uh, you know it could have been anybody. So I I really feel for this issue because it's it's just I, I don't know it's just gotten really out of hand, and um, it, I I expect the market to correct at some point, but I could be totally wrong. So yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting because there's a wealth transfer taking place uh, of families that are, you know, helping their kids into properties that they otherwise couldn't yeah. afford. And that wealth is actually being transferred to other households. And so there's an interesting way in which, like, even the effort to help someone in your family results in you taking a considerable amount of money that you otherwise would be securing for later and giving that to some family that's moving out or to some, you know, a retired person or to some investment bank. And basically, there's a lot of money sloshing through the system, uh, partly because of low interest rates, um, but also because of, you know, a genuine uh, system where we have systemically block the supply of new housing and made it much more difficult and more expensive. And and we're reaping what we have sowed. Uh, I think there's been a lot of decisions around housing that have based on, been based on aesthetics. I want my neighborhood to look and feel a certain way and not been based on reality yeah. and not be, been based on, on economic reasons why uh, doing so has actually been profoundly harmful. And so there's, yeah, uh, uh, so much there, but it is, I mean, it's it's hopeful that there's a lot of attention on it right now. I said, you know, at the federal level, uh, we had all three of our major parties all saying that they were going to be the one to take action on housing affordability. That's fairly new. And they were addressing ways in which they understood that suburbs were holding back on uh, adding new housing and that that was going to be required. The challenge is that every government loves to just begin layering on top down regulations. And that's not going to be the thing that helps us. We need to get out of the way more uh, in so many different. Yeah, we do need to get out of our own way. Um, well, let's leave it there. This is a great discussion. I appreciate having you on today. Um, before we finish, it is time for the down zone, which is the part of this show where we share anything that we have been reading, watching, listening to anything we've been up to. Uh, so Norm, I'm going to put you on the stop on the spot. Hopefully you have a great, uh, down zone for us today. What have you been up to? Yeah, uh, a show that I recently was watching and really enjoying and also reading the books uh, that became the source material for this. Uh, the books are by Louise Penny, and she is an author that writes uh, mystery uh, novels. Uh, I, th- I think they call them soft cozies or something or cozy, not or cozy. What, and I think you used that <laughs> phrase a while back, but um, there it's, it's great reading. But the show is called Three Pines, okay. and it's a really great like mystery whodunit sort of show and just w- very well acted. Uh, Alfred Molina is the chief inspector uh, playing Inspector Gamache, and he's he's fantastic uh, at, in that role. And you just really get a sense of what it feels like to live in this community of Three Pines. And I do have a, a bit of a random connection uh, to one of the main characters, uh, who is a, a younger uh, police officer. And she and I actually met the Minister of Finance in uh, the Canadian Minister of Finance at the time uh, because he was visiting towns and they asked the student council leaders to show up and meet this uh, important official uh, at uh, the Lethbridge City Hall. And she went on to become a famous or a, well, rel- quite famous actor. And uh, I, I get to be at Strong Town. So uh, <laughs> just look how we both turned out. So. Uh, yeah, that's that was my recommendation is Three Pines. So, and I have a little personal connection. Very, very cool. Well, so I actually have one that I've mentioned on the show before, probably, probably like two years ago. But I am re-listening to a podcast that I probably listen to all the way through at least once a year. I think it was one of the first podcasts that I ever, ever even listened to. 
Um, but it's called The Dream, and it's hosted by Jane Marie, who is formerly of This American Life, and Dan Gallucci. Um, season one and two basically focuses, it's an investigation on multi-level marketing and the wellness industry. Um, so season one is multi-level marketing. Season two is the wellness industry. And it looks into different companies and how it works and why people are attracted to being part of these industries and you know being a part of these products. And they actually have a third season that is apparently coming out that's going to focus on the life coaching and self-improvement industry. So I this is actually one of my favorite podcasts. I highly recommend it to anybody. I I am listening to seasons one and two so that I can be ready to listen to season three. I'm I'm just fascinated by these kind of niche industries that are, you know, they kind of seem like scams and people say that they're not, but they kind of seem like they're scams. So I just I just love that. It's it's really fascinating, especially with me not knowing a lot about multi-level marketing before I listened to this and um, seeing a lot of people involved in these multi-level marketing companies online and just through my Facebook feed, it's really fascinating and relatable uh, in some ways to ha- have somebody really investigate and dig into how these companies work and why they exist in the first place. And even some of the federal activities in our government that are upholding these activities. Well, I mean, Abby, I heard you say that you have a sinus problem and I, I'm an official distributor of Sirius Sam sinus uh, solver. And so if you want, <laughs> I can send it to you. I, I can sell it for you. I'll be part of your downline. That's right. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I'll send you the kit. Yeah. yeah. Your life will never be great. Yeah, that's great. Let me know when your conference is. I'll, <laughs> I'll go to it. Um, yeah, no, I, I highly recommend it. If you have any curiosity about these industries, um, you know, I, I definitely five, 10 years ago, I used to see it all over the place. I don't see people advertising for these things quite as much now. And I, I'm not sure if I'm just older or um, if it's that people aren't really participating as much, who knows. But uh, yeah, it, these are kind of niche industries that are fascinating to learn about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really wonder sometimes if all of those skills that people have when they really get into these types of schemes, um, if in part they are not being given the opportunities to do sort of the bottom up, like the start in a uh, start a, a business in the back of your yard or those types of things, because we've actually restricted so many of those types of things, if that actually f- almost squeezes a lot of talent into otherwise uh, things that people wouldn't have taken as much interest in. Yes. And if the longing connection because of the way that we've built our communities make something like a Tupperware party something you will actually go to well Tupperware is probably old it school is the now. old school um, yeah but there's lots yeah, of new yeah. ones. <laughs> totally and and what does it offer it offers people a chance a reason to come together and to spend time in each other's presence even with the veneer of like I came for one reason and realized I've been ambushed for another and yet I stay like I'm willing to to put myself through this or join and just, yeah, uh, dive right in uh, to the deep. Yes. End. So the show actually does talk about that and it goes into the communities and the socio-demographic uh, uh, characteristics that are actually targeted by these companies in order to really draw people in based on whether or not they're attracted to the social aspects of going to these parties or um, even, you know, maybe having a misunderstanding of how to run a small business and being sold this idea that it's just going to be set up for me and I'll be able to be be my own boss and make my own money, um, even if it's challenging to make actually profit in some of these companies. So yeah, I, it, they go into all of that and they interview people who have been involved. And a lot of the times it's people from small towns as well. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Actually, a lot of it's really sad, but it is fascinating. So, um, let's end it there. Thank you so So much. Yeah, there will be no MLMs in a strong town. How about that? (laughs) Yes, please, please don't do that. Um, Well, let's end it there. Thanks, everyone, for listening to another episode of UpZoned. Keep doing what you can to build a strong town. And thanks so much, Norm. See you later.